Question, what if saving the world could be fun? Broccoli is not much fun. We know we're supposed to like it and it's good for us, but eh. Right now, environmentalism is a lot like broccoli. If you ask 10 thoughtful people about taking environmental action, maybe eight will say something like, I know I should do more, or I'm just too damn busy, or I drive my Prius to the recycle center. <laughs> to have one face in 10 light up at the prospect would be a surprise. We're confronted by an overwhelming number of problems, and we feel powerless to affect the necessary changes. Uh, Where's the fun in this? For the only species that systematically damages its own life support system, this particular lack of fun is a serious problem. For the last 36 years, working mostly in the Mojave Desert, are you working? Are you going? Yes. Uh, I've studied these animals, desert tortoises. I like that reaction. Uh, I'm a field grunt. I go out and I gather data for later analysis, and I love this job because it maximizes my time with tortoises. Simply by being themselves, they constantly amaze, amuse, and befuddle me. Here's a case in point. Big male, 43, trundling down a wash. I look over, and here's a little male, half his size, kind of hanging out at the edge, and he's nervous. He knows 43 is coming. But rather than turn tail and run, as I expect him to, he, he marches out in, for, in front of 43. 43 head bobs, rams him, bam, bam, bam. Eventually flips him over. The little guy struggles, rights himself, scuttles away. At camp, I tell the story, and a coworker says, that little guy's been following 43 around for a couple of weeks, picking fights with him. He never wins. What was going on? Assuming he wasn't insane, why was this little tortoise constantly inviting certain and unpleasant defeat? Behavior like this suggests a level of complexity that we don't normally attribute to um, simple animals like tortoises. Hundreds of experiences like this over the years have broken down the barrier between me and my subject. And the day arrived when I felt, in my core, that time spent with a tortoise was time spent with a relative, that the differences between us were minor compared to what we shared. My life became incomparably richer when I began to see first tortoises and then all living things as my family. It's a measure of our ecological alienation, though, that it took me so long to come to such an obvious conclusion. And I'm a nature guy. In the late 70s and early 80s, I could often find 10 or more tortoises a day. And now on the same plots, I can go days without seeing a single one. Population declines of 80, 90, 95% have occurred over much of the range of the species. And my job has mostly been to take careful notes on a quiet catastrophe. Here you're seeing the results of one particularly bad season. We collected 398 carcasses, and there were only 30 tortoises left alive on this plot. This new solitude in a desert drained of tortoises breaks my heart. My teachers are disappearing. The factors leading to the decline of the tortoise are many, and they, they play out in many places around the world. Uh, habitat destruction and degradation, pollution, poaching, uh, disease, and drought. But one factor that's particularly significant for tortoises is the proliferation of ravens. We're doing a sort of ecological alchemy. We're turning our garbage into ravens, and we provide water, food, nesting sites and hunting perches for these birds, and they're happy for the handout. In the last, well, between 1975 and 95, raven numbers increased a thousand percent in the West Mojave Desert. More people equals more ravens, and more ravens equal fewer tortoises. We've got a little... This is what a raven does to a juvenile tortoise. 
And this is what a single pair of ravens did to over 250 juvenile tortoises in the vicinity of their nest in just a few years. Uh, raven numbers have increased by orders of magnitude in the last half century, and as they've done so, the odds of any juvenile tortoise surviving have shrunk to near zero in many places. The decline of the desert tortoise is a sort of collateral damage from the way we do business. Uh, the sad irony of the situation is that this animal that's so good of necessity at monitoring its environment is imperiled by the human species, which so often fails to pay attention to its effect on the planet. That's pretty depressing. <laughs> Uh, it's a fairly standard environmental tale of woe, and it's a true story, but it's not the whole truth. The whole truth includes the fact that when I leave camp, I'm propelled by this sense of adventure and discovery. I know every day I'm going to see something I've never seen before, and possibly something that no one's ever seen before. It's a wonderful feeling. Also true is the fact that if I'm lucky enough to find a desert tortoise, I'll have this opportunity to deepen my understanding, learning not only about the animal, but from it as well. Also, part of the whole truth is the tortoises are still out there. They're hanging in there, incredibly resilient animals. And what they really need is just for us to give them a break. It's the opinion of this field grunt that we ought to give them that break. But how? I got tired of documenting the decline of the tortoise and went looking for new approaches to the raven problem. And I found a man named Pete Batar who was experimenting with lasers to repel birds from the ends of runways. He joined me in the desert to run some tests and the results were spectacular. These are ravens fleeing lasers. We quickly moved to begin designing a, a laser-based raven no-fly zone, a place <laughs> I, yeah, I thought it was a catchy one, too. Uh, <laughs> a place where juvenile tortoises could escape predation. And we presented our early findings to uh, a group of conservationists, the Desert Tortoise Council, last February. And the talk got a great response. And afterwards, Pete and I were talking about possible applications. And he said, you know what would be cool? If someone could aim and fire the laser remotely using an inter over an internet connection, and this, he'd been playing with this thought for a while, but this landed like a seed in my brain. And at four the next morning, it sprouted. And I had this idea, or the idea had me. And in the last year, dozens of collaborators have contributed to it. And I'm sharing it with you now in the hope that you too will refine and spread it. The idea has just a few moving parts. It's actually pretty simple. And I'll go over here. This is the bubble of games. Games are taking over. In a 2010 TED Talk, Jane McGonigal estimated that humans played 156 billion hours a year of electronic games. And the games industry is poised this year to make $100 billion. So clearly, fun sells. And this bubble of fun that is the game world grows and grows. But the escapism of games offers no real escape. Back on planet Earth, we've got some serious troubles. Rampant invasive species, poaching, growing list of threatened and endangered species, air pollution, water pollution, climate chaos, fracking in Fukushima, and on and on. A list like this is enough to put anyone in a dark mood. We've resigned ourselves to the idea that taking environmental action uh, it has to be deadly serious business. We approach environmental action, when we approach it at all, with a kind of um, earnestness, a grim earnestness. We're kind of dutifully doing, uh, you know, we're sacrificing some of our time for a worthy cause. But somewhere between the bubble and the trouble, are the gizmos. People are making these amazing devices for uh, long distance viewing and monitoring of environments and tools with effects at great distances. 
the spread of these machines is amazing. Uh, rovers and submersibles and aerial drones equipped with GPS and cameras and environmental sensors. We've got them in the sky and we've got them at the bottom of the ocean and we've got them on Mars. So at four in the morning in a Vegas hotel room, this is what I saw. Players with remotely controlled devices doing real conservation work. I saw channels for this vast pool of human awareness contained in the game world to flow into the real world to the benefit of the community of life. I saw players looking for winning strategies and finding deep truths about this amazing planet. I saw them seeking fun but finding meaning as well, eager to help because the act of helping was joyful. I saw bubblers with gizmos fixing troubles and it was beautiful. Thank you. I call this endeavor crowdsourced conservation. If we make games of solving environmental and ecological puzzles, we can tap the vast creative potential of the playful human spirit. So let's look at a few possible examples. Players controlling uh, submersibles in the Caribbean could compete to capture Indo-Pacific lionfish. These voracious invaders, they don't belong there, are gobbling their way through the fish of the Caribbean. But if we tap human competitive instincts, we can start to reclaim the reefs. And such a template could work for other invasive species as well. Uh, pythons in the Everglades, Asiatic carp threatening the Great Lakes, cane toads in the tropics. Elephants and rhinos are being poached to extinction. Uh, players could monitor video feeds from an array of drones over the plains of Africa and report on the movements of possible poachers to rangers on the ground. And how about games monitoring tropical forests for illegal mining and logging? And uh, teams of players, well, I heard that, ah. Oh, uh, that's the cutest tortoise I've ever seen, by the way. Uh, teams of players could, uh, with different tools, could collaborate in desert tortoise conservation. They could engage in uh, ecological management such as predation reduction, behavioral observations, uh, fostering the spread of the growth of native plants and preventing the spread of invasive species. And the basis of the competition could be the quality of the data collected and the well-being of the tortoises in the care of the team. So, six crowds in crowdsource conservation, and each one makes a contribution. Biologists bring ecological knowledge. They identify possible candidates for the, for the games. Uh, the, the gearheads, the inventors, give us the devices we need. The game designers help us structure the games. The game players bring their well-honed skills and their talented thumbs, and environmental organizations help spread the word. But each group benefits as well. The biologists get thousands of virtual assistants. The gearheads get these, these wonderful technical challenges. Game companies will be able to lay claim to tangible social benefits. Uh, the players get a brand new kind of compelling and meaningful game to play, and the environmental organizations make contact with a new generation that wants meaning but also enjoyment as well. Not an unreasonable idea, actually. The sixth crowd is the creatures of the earth, and they provide the wonder, and they gain much-needed human caring and concern. Call it love. Well, I returned home to Haines, Alaska last summer, and I had the idea but nothing to show. So I asked a couple of very clever friends of mine who are in the house tonight um, if they could create a rover controlled over the Internet. High school science teacher Mark Fontenot did the mechanics, and his star pupil, yeah, that's Holden, and he wasn't harmed in the making of the video, as you'll see. Uh, Mark and Eli built this proof-of-concept rover, and clearly it worked. Um, <laughs> coming on stage now is version two. This was done by Roy Haggard and Chris Smith. 
and I'm queuing the rover, and here it comes. Um, This is a new way of seeing your planet. I'm not as pretty as a tortoise, but you could imagine we're going to be doing tortoise observations with this vehicle this spring. This is the second in a line of machines that are going to give us a brand new way of seeing our planet and tools to do good work. Roy is, is playing around on the stage and exploring in much the same way that players will be able to explore their world. Uh, I'm tremendously excited by this development, and I couldn't do this. This is crowdsourcing on a small scale because I can't make that, but really clever engineers can. We live on a planet of marvels. <laughs> do you need help? Uh, and when, when people gain a personal connection with this planet, they're going to love it. But we don't love that which we don't know. And we can't know that which we ignore. So let's create a way for everyone with an internet connection to have fun doing good. Let's give a legion of gamers the tools they need, powerful enough tools. <laughs> oh, he made it. Uh, the, the tools they need to accomplish epic tasks. Let's give every player the chance to have the sort of imagination stretching experience I had with Tortoise 43 and that upstart. Let's unleash the power of the web to save the bigger web that sustains us all, the web of life. Brow beating and guilt tripping haven't worked. It's time for us to invite everyone to play. Human survival is ultimately going to be a crowdsourced enterprise. Step one, I think, is fun, connecting players with planet. They may come seeking simple enjoyment, but we can help them see the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of this astounding playground, Earth. We're going to learn a lot about ourselves and more about our planet. I can't wait to get going on this adventure. I hope you'll join me on it. And I'll tell you this, it's going to be a lot more fun than broccoli. So I'll end, I'll end with the same question I started with, ask you to think about it. What if saving the world could be fun? Thank you. But wait, there's more. For the first time in the history of, of public speaking, get out your phones, please. We have a game to play. All of you who, uh, if the house lights could come up, all of you who downloaded the Raven Repel app, get your phones out and fire the application up because you're now going to be part of the first ever crowdsource conservation game. So whoever loaded it, your, your phone is now a Raven repulsion device. You'll see the Ravens appear. There's a proximity meter at the top, and there's also a scoreboard up here, and it's 540 to 539 right now, and the winning team gets the rover. Fire up the game, start playing. Let's see how the score goes. Find those ravens, tap the screen, and you zap them. You gotta look around. Wave your phone around until you see a raven. When you do, they're mostly going to be lower toward the horizon. They might be a little below the horizon. And when you see them, oh, it's happening. Find those ravens. You've got a bunch of baby tortoises on the floor here. You've got to protect them. And the winning team gets the keen rover. You've got incentive here. Come on. It looks like the greens are ahead. Come on, red. Oh. Let's go. We got ravens to repulse. It's tied. This is so exciting. <laughs> We're about done. Greed's ahead. Five, four, three. Two, one, and the green team wins. <laughs> You've played the first crowdsource conservation game. 
Here's the point. We've been doing environmentalism on adrenaline. We need to do it on endorphins. I hope you had a few endorphins cruising through your system. Thanks a lot.